Welcome to Rebecca Sounds Reveille. We have a treat for you today because with me is someone who has been a guest on the show before. In fact, he was a guest when I first started out in radio many years ago. He is an award-winning author, an entrepreneur, a pilot with nearly eight thousand hours in the air. He has founded two corporate uh, aircraft refinishing centers. He's a lay minister, songwriter, recording artist, husband, father, grandfather, and a good friend of mine. He's known for his series surrounding Cody Musket, bringing his writing into focus on American war culture related issues, such as human trafficking, PTSD, racism, and deep matters of the heart. The Cody Musket story is listed by NBC, CBS as a top mystery thriller book series. And that was in June of 2020. He now um, works and continues to aspire to bring these things to life and touch the lives of so many people around him. And letting that ripple effect flow with us today is James Nathaniel Miller II. Welcome to the show. Hello, Rebecca. You can you call Hi, me Jim. I'm so My friends call me Jim. So You're I know what your audience. Jim. So Jim, it is for today. Yeah. I know what your audience is thinking right now that this guy looks too young to have done all that stuff, right? <laughs> Well, I've got to tell you, the things that you have done have been really profound in the series. And when we first uh, met, we were just talking about the beginning of all of the things that you've released over the last uh, a few years. I'm going to make it sound like it's not that long. And um, it's it's been such a wonderful journey because it's touched so many lives. And I've got to hear where you are at now and how you've got there. Well, the first thing is I'm astound- I'm as astounded as anyone because, um, you know, I never started out to be a writer. Um, when I started off, I, I went to, uh, you know, I, I went to Baylor University. And uh, but before that, I wanted to be a naval aviator. And I actually went down when I was a junior in high school. I went down to the uh, to the uh, naval recruiting office. And I came home with an arm, two arms full of, you know, brochures and everything. And man, I was all gung ho and all that kind of stuff because I'd always wanted to fly my whole life. And uh, that was when I was like a junior in high school. But then a couple of things happened that changed my the direction of my life from that. Um, first of all, my uh, my father had recently passed away. And my mom was having a very hard time readjusting Sorry. afterward. And uh, had I gone into the military right then, I would have ended up in Vietnam. And I just didn't know if I wanted to put my mother through that extra stress at that time. Sure. But the other thing that happened was that that the toward the end of that year, I experienced what I felt like was a very real call to the ministry. Mm -hmm. And so I decided to put my Navy plans on hold and I entered Baylor University. And the rest of my life has been just a roller coaster, but it's all been an adventure. And I have to say that I never regretted making that decision. Um, After after I graduated from Baylor. That was in 1970. So, yeah, I'm an old guy. I've been around a while. And um, uh, I found the first thing I found out after I right before I graduated is that God's greatest creation ever was woman. And that I had married that I met the finest one in the world ever created. And I married her and I'm still married to her today. That is and so neat. So I, I still introduce her as my first wife. <laughs> and and I tell people uh I tell people uh here's a picture of the woman I'm sleeping with for the last 53 years. <laughs> and uh so but anyway what happened was after we after I graduated from Baylor I went into a sort of a uh, 
I became an itinerant speaker. Uh, I was a songwriter. I played the guitar and I, I sang and did a lot of my own music. And uh, I did become a pilot. And uh, my senior year at Baylor, I, I got my pilot certification. And my wife and I, Carla and I, we were still newlyweds. And we began to travel the country. And I began a, a sort of a, a, a career, I guess you'd say, as a itinerant speaker and and recording artist. And a couple of my songs actually made the charts in the what, what's now known as the beginning segment of or the beginning parts of uh, the uh, what's called contemporary Christian music. In the beginning of that movement, I was part of that, I guess. I, I started writing stuff that was uh, had a little bit of a beat to it and uh, with a lot of acoustic instruments and things like that. And that opened a lot of doors for me to, to get, go places, you know. And my wife and I were able to fly into, we had a small plane. We were able to fly into some areas that are a little bit harder to get to from, from other for other groups and bands and and evangelists and so we f would fly into these little mountain communities in northern california and oregon and we would set up at a at the football stadium or the high school or some other venue and uh we we saw some real uh, amazing things happen a lot of people's lives uh seemed to be changed and we had uh, people would come from miles around, you know, to hear to hear what we had to say. And people were interested in what I had to say, even though I was really pretty much unknown. I love yet it was uh, it was a terrific experience. And one of the things that happened during those years, and this became very significant later in life for me, which I'll explain in a few minutes, is that, uh, you know, in, in the late 70s, when all this was happening, the Vietnam War was was uh, coming to an end, had come to an end. And there were a lot of young war veterans coming home from overseas. And a lot of them were younger than I was. And I would go to these meetings and I would share at, at venues and things, you know, and, and it wasn't long before some of these young veterans began to come up to me after the meeting was over and they would want to talk privately. So, you know, in those days, I knew nothing about PTSD. I didn't know anything about, I think they called it battle fatigue back then. And there was a stigma that came with it. Yes. You know, if, if you came home from the war and you had issues, then a lot of people just thought that was because you were a coward or something, you know, or, or that you just weren't strong enough. To, so, so guys didn't like to talk about it. And I don't know to this day exactly why they felt compelled to come talk to me after these meetings, but we, I would sit down with a few, you know, I sat down with a few of these guys and I heard some horrendous battlefield stories. And these were guys that were younger than I was and they had experienced all this stuff already. And their lives were just wrecked. They talked about what it had been like since they had come home and how they weren't accepted and how uh, people thought they were baby killers and, you know, things like that. And, uh, um, my best friend in high school was uh, had been in uh, Vietnam. He enlisted the day after we graduated from high school. Oh. And I didn't see him until eight years later. And, you know, like I say, we'd been best buddies in high school and it was hard to keep up with him because, you know, in the military, they move around so much and everything. Yeah. And, but I heard that he was back home. And so I went and I visited him and he was not the same man that I had known before. Oh. And I couldn't figure out why all he wanted to talk about was high school. And this was eight years after high school. And I, I wonder why he didn't like to talk about what had happened to him and why, 
the things he had accomplished, you know, he'd won a purple heart and he was a decorated veteran. And, and uh, then I found out because one day, and I didn't ask him, you know, you, you don't ask a veteran, Hey, what happened to you in the war? You just don't do that. So, but he began to talk one day and he began to tell me about the first time that he had killed somebody. Oh boy. And then he told me that he had been wounded twice. And the second time they, they picked him up on the battlefield out of the jungle and flew him home, flew him to a hospital in a Huey helicopter. He told me what that was like. He said, I thought I was going to die. So we talked some more and uh, it turns out that his family had, uh, had left him. Um, They couldn't, they, they could not live with him. He was not the same person as before. It was too much stress. He was all by himself. He was all alone. And, uh, you know, there are a lot of other things that I don't want to share about, about that, but sure. uh, he's not with us anymore. He's gone, but I'm so sorry. You know, it just, I guess because of all of that, I just have a special place in my heart for veterans, you know, and, so anyway, we we continued uh, traveling and and uh, and everything it, for about seven years. We we were on the road constantly, and then uh, after about that long, my wife Carla, <laughs> who had traveled with me all those places and spent all those hours in the air and going places, she was absolutely worn out. Oh, he was very tired from what we had done. And and really, I was, too. And besides all of that, the economy had totally collapsed in the country. You remember in the late 70s how they had all the homeless people that would just move in droves from town to town, setting up their tents in the city parks and going to different places and uh and, uh, you know, not being able to find work, unemployment was about 20 percent plus in some in some places. And uh, inflation was about 16 percent or more. And it was just a terrible economic time, the worst time it, that I could remember in my entire life. And so the, a lot of the venues that had invited me to come speak and to play, you know, and everything, uh, play my guitar and all that, uh, they could no longer, they no longer were inviting us because they didn't have the money to pay our expenses and everything. So I finally faced the music and real, no pun intended. And I realized that I was going to have to do something, to, you know, to, to support us and, or we were. And so, uh, I went to work one summer with a company that painted aircraft in Waco. It was a brand new operation. And the guy that ran the paint shop had been, a was a decorated uh, craftsman, I guess you'd say. He had won several awards as an aircraft painter and he really knew his business. And for some reason he took me under his wing and taught me everything he knew. Well, about six, and I found out that I was uh, I was good at it, and I, I I loved it. I liked the work. I liked creating things with my hands. You know, I just didn't know that I had it in me to do that. But after about six months, he just threw up his hands and he said, "I quit." So he just left. He just up and quit overnight. Well. The other employees and I, you know, we, we start thinking, what are we going to do? You know, I mean, uh, it's hard enough to find a job anyway. And the economic conditions were so bad. It was a terrible time to try to start a business, you know. But I sat down one day and I thought about it. And you know what I did? <laughs> I decided I got the crew together and said, OK, look, Paul has taught me everything he knows. And uh, I said, let's just keep the company going. I'll just take it over and, and you guys, you know, I'll pay you guys and uh, I'll be in charge and I'll just, I'll just do it myself. Well, they were all for that. 
And I told Carla what, what we were going to do. I didn't have, I didn't take it. I had not taken one single uh, course in college on business. I had not, uh, I didn't know anything about the X's and O's of business. <laughs> had 120 bucks in my pocket. And nobody told me that I couldn't start a business on $120. So we just went right ahead, you know, and, uh, and it's just pretty much on a wing and a prayer, if you will. And after I took over this company, something happened inside of me that just totally changed the focus of my life. I started thinking to myself, you know, if I could make a go of this company, if I could make this work, and then maybe we could prosper and we would have the money to start supporting the poor and maybe money to start helping people, you know, find jobs and things like this. And that became uh, an overnight goal of mine. And so uh, after a few months, uh, the company began to grow and we were just you know, barely staying, staying with it. But we moved to another town. We moved away from Waco and moved to a place called Kennedy, Texas. Okay. I won't tell you all the reasons why. It's between San Antonio and uh, Corpus Christi, if anybody knows anything about Texas. So we moved to Kennedy. And uh, I, I felt like I had been given a vision, you know, not a, not a vision vision, but a, just a, a vision for life, you know, by God to start this business, this company, because I thought we could help people. And so in the airplane business, you deal with a lot of hazardous chemicals like methylene chloride, phenol, uh, chromates, things that are on the EPA hit list. So what we did is we hired a, 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 uh, an environmental engineer to come in and help us develop our shop so that we could handle the hazardous waste in a legal manner. Sure. What we did is we built these big drying beds right outside beside the hangar with lined with plastic and we had it burned up on the sides, you know, so it would be like a big tank, but it was right on the ground. And what we would do is when we would wash the aircraft off, we'd strip the airpl airplanes with chemicals to get all the paint off of them. And then we'd have to, wash that off the plane and those things were filled with hazardous chemicals so we washed it in the wastewater into these drying beds and that way they would just evaporate and you wouldn't get it into the ground see to contaminate the groundwater and everything sure and so this was what this environmental engineer uh, told us to do and he helped us to learn you know to, to do it okay everything went great for about a month or two after we moved to kennedy and one morning, we, we were renting this old building. You know, it had been used for painting airplanes before, years before. So we rented this old building. And that's where our operation was. And one morning, the water, a water pipe on the exterior side of the building, on the outside of the building, broke. And it was pouring gallons of water into this drying bed, which already had the hazardous waste in it. Oh, no. And within a few minutes, it was going to overflow into the yard. And so we're all standing around looking at this. And I was, like I said, I was inexperienced. You know, I didn't, I didn't know much about running a business in those days. Um, and I certainly wasn't prepared for something like that. We didn't have the right tools. We didn't even know where the water cutoff was because it was in a field somewhere at the other end of the airport. And we, hadn't, we didn't know exactly where to go to cut the water off down there. And by the time we could have, you know, called somebody, a plumber to come out or somebody like that, well, it would have been too late. So we're all standing around talking and we're watching this water go. And all the guys came up to me and said, Jim, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Well, while they were asking me that, I was silently asking God the same question. Sure. And I said, and I said, God, what are we going to do? Uh, do something. <laughs> I mean, you know, it's just concentrate, Lord. And so all of a sudden, I looked up, and here comes this little white pickup truck from the other end of the airport as fast as you can. Now, we had not called anyone. We didn't even have cell phones in those days. We had, you know, telephones, but we didn't have 
time to call a plumber, like I said. And this guy comes around the corner in his little pickup. He stops right there beside where we're all gathered around looking at this water coming out. And on the side of the truck, it said Pedro's plumbing. And this guy gets out of the truck, walks over. And he says, I'm looking for a Mr. Miller. Uh-oh. And so I said, well, you found him. And uh, he says, well, he says, sir, I was down at the Lions Club meeting earlier this morning. And they said that there was a new aircraft painting company that had opened up here at the airport. And I just wanted to come out and pay you a routine visit and let you know that if you ever needed a plumber, I'm your man. Oh, what a calling right there. And I said, I said, you see that water running out of that pipe right there? He goes, oh, my gosh. <laughs> so in about five minutes, he has, you know, has the pipe fixed and uh, we were still in business. But we were looking we were looking at huge fines and oh, sure, possibly even jail time or something. Back in those days, it was really you know, not to mention the bad press we would have gotten and all that stuff. My, our dream would have been over before it got started. But, and so in the, then all the guys kept coming up to me saying, man, Jim, I can't believe that, you know? And, you know, from then on, anything I said about God, those guys were all ears. And it sort of set the, the sort of set the tempo from what our business was going to be all about as the years went by. And, you know, uh, we, um, uh, we began to, uh, we began to prosper. And uh, eventually we were about a year and a half later, we were invited by the city of Uvalde to move our whole business to Uvalde. They were going to build us brand new hangars. They had other aircraft industries at the airport. It was a bigger airport, much greater opportunity. And they wanted us to move there. And so we did. We moved our whole company there. And within 10 years, we had one of the premier aircraft painting companies in the world. That and we had, we had started with nothing in the worst environment economically that you could have. And we had gone to the top of the food chain. It took all told about 20 years before we really became established in that way. But we started painting aircraft for Fortune 500 companies, movie stars, um, you know, uh, sports athlete, athletes and uh, for um, aircraft manufacturers, astronauts. And we were painting by the late 90s, we were painting over 100 corporate aircraft per year. And we were supporting 10 different outreaches throughout the world. Uh, for example, we, we supported a, uh, an operation out of Fort Worth named Life Outreach, which, which was digging water wells in Africa so that African children no longer had to drink the water out of the of the holes in the street, you know, the puddles in the street. Sure. And we helped to build an orphanage in South America for, uh, for refugee children. And we did a lot of, uh, a lot of things like that because we were able to, God blessed us enough to be able to do that. That is such it was a just powerful. A, it was just an opportunity, a, a, a unique opportunity that we were given and I also continued during those years, I continued my I, taking speaking engagements and things like that. And I've served on several boards of directors and people were interested in hearing what I had to say. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, and I would, my message was to people everywhere, you know, God loves you and God will meet your needs. That's and true. we had proved that in our fast rise to prominence in the aircraft industry, because um, without, <laughs> obviously, without the supernatural hand of God, we wouldn't have, we wouldn't have survived six months. And I also um, served as a uh, volunteer in uh, some of the uh, uh, juvenile uh, correctional centers in Texas. 
We also, another thing we did is we established a chaplaincy program at a Texas penitentiary near Hondo. And so all of those years, it was just, uh, I don't know, just looking back on it, I can't believe it all happened. But sure. and here I was, didn't know anything about business. Uh, we started in the worst economic environment you could possibly have. And, uh, you know, and there and there we were, there we were, you know, started on a wing and a prayer. <laughs> that's, that's really exciting. And then how long after did you start the Cody Muskets series? Well, what happened was uh, I sold the company in 1999 because I was burned out by then. Okay. I mean, all the success we had and everything else, but there was a lot of stress and one thing or another. And I wanted to get back into hands-on, you know, going out and meeting the people and speaking and doing all these things again. Um, I missed that, you know, and, but then uh, another economic disaster struck. We sold the company in 1999. And then of course, in 2001, we had 9-11 and we had uh, the, the economy totally collapsed. And I had a lot of investments and I lost several million dollars in the stock market and the financial markets. Oh no. And uh, my life, I just kind of hit rock bottom for a few years and didn't, uh, I just was went around shaking my head, my head, you know, why did I, why did I sell the company? I thought it was the right thing to do. I was, I wanted to just go out and help people, you know, and, and, and all these things. And after about two or three years, um, I just I realized that I was kind of living in a, a state of constant uh, fear and dread. And, and somebody that really trusts God isn't supposed to be that way. So I, f I felt guilty about that. And what I finally realized is that I, I still trusted God, but I didn't trust myself anymore. And that's what it amounted to. I just felt like I was just um, a loser. I felt like a loser. I tried and tried and tried to make that money back. I tried started other businesses and nothing worked anymore. And finally, I gave up and, and I said, you know what? For some reason, maybe I've done something wrong. Maybe I, I just don't know. And, uh, and then uh, I finally... Uh, about it's about 2012, I think it was, or 2013. Uh, I asked God one question. I said, I said, um, okay, uh, I can't hear your voice anymore. I don't know what you're saying. I mean, are you trying to tell me something? And without thinking, uh, these, I heard in my mind these words, and it wasn't like a physical voice. It was like in my, it was in my head, but it sounded like my voice, like I was talking to myself, but I really wasn't. What is it? What the voice said, now that you've lost your faith and your fortune, which one would you have me restore? Oh, that's I thought, powerful. I thought, was that God speaking? <laughs> And I didn't think it was. I thought it was just my mind, you know, go, going crazy or something. But anyway, um, I uh, went on for a few more years. I, I I'd like to say that my whole life changed then, but it, it didn't get any better. It just kept on the same way it was. But I think it was a turning point, maybe. Finally, in uh, about 2013, we were in Safford, Arizona. I had started another business out there after it sold the one here and after we'd lost a lot of money. So I thought I'd get back in business again. And I did, but it didn't work out at all. And uh, that's another long story. But anyway, so I ended up selling it in 2008. And in 2013, we had a guy come speak. And this is going to sound way out in left field for a lot of people. So what happened was uh, to make a long story short, and maybe I can Maybe I can go a little longer next time, or maybe if I come back, I can explain the rest of it. But I definitely want to have you back. There's so much to share here. Yeah. Well, I uh, I went to a meeting one night, and uh, I mean, I went to a a movie one night, and I was sitting there, and my wife had given me a 
passed to the, to a movie. I went and sat there, and as I was watching this movie, it was the boringest movie I've ever seen. But while it was playing, this new this other story popped into my head that I had not ever thought about. And it was the story of a U.S. Marine who had crashed his airplane in Afghanistan and had met a young woman. He had become a professional baseball player afterwards. And then he met a young woman in, on a road trip when he was with the team on a road trip. And he uh, fell in love. And she, had, uh, she was a single mom who had exposed a child trafficking ring. And she had a price on her head. And this story just came into my mind out of nowhere. I started developing that story in my head. And I didn't know what I was going to do with it. And finally, I told Carla about it. And she says, you need to write it down. Yes. So I did. And I wrote for three years. When I got done, I had the Cody Musket story. And it's about a U.S. Marine. And I was able to write into the story, into the this story, a, a lot of the events that I had been told years ago by those young men who would come to me with those terrible stories of theirs and tell me what their lives were like after coming back. So I was, I was able to, to realistically write the life of this, of this man. And when I released the book in a novel, historical fiction novel, it made the Amazon number one Kindle bestseller list twice, two different times. Yes. And now it's a five book series uh, called the Cody Musket series. But uh, that's, but I can, I can give more details on that later, but yeah. I, I think we should, because there's a lot about this. And just that first book alone, the No Pit So Deep, is pretty pretty valuable for life lessons within itself. And I want the audience just to connect with that. Because once they, once they start on that, I mean, the rest is going to be uh, mm-hmm. something that they're going to want to embrace. And then... I want to share about it being on Audible. So we've got lots to talk about. I want to thank you so much for getting us up to speed this far with the direction that we need to go, because all of the things that you've shared are definitely things that people can identify with. They, They will be able to really have some insight going into the series itself. And I've got to just ask you, Tell us, please, if you will, where can they connect with you on and start getting connected with you and Cody? Well, I have a Facebook author page, and that's uh, www.facebook slash no pit so deep. That's the name of the story, no pit so deep. And the subtitle is the Cody Musket story, but just Facebook dot it's facebook.com slash no pit so deep and that'll get my author page and uh, then we also have an author page on amazon if you go to if you go to the book uh page and scroll down it'll say connect with with, uh, james and james and tanner miller the second and uh it'll take you to my amazon author page with all of the books that we have and audio books and everything like that beautiful i love it thank you so much for your time thus far we will be talking with you again very, very soon because we've got to really get into this series and why and how it's going to be so applicable to, to so many people on so many levels from first responders, veterans, more. There's just so much more. Thank you so much, Jim, for your time with us today. Thank you, Rebecca. God bless. We'll see you soon. I want to thank all of you for tuning into another episode of Rebecca Sounds Rowley. Jim and I go back way Uh, way back to the very, very first book, No Pit So Deep. And I'm going to tell you, knowing what I know about this, it's going to be something that you will want to embrace, not only for yourself, but for those that are in your immediate circle and those that are in your extended family as well. Make sure you share this show with everybody that you know on social media, friends, family, loved ones, and as always, everybody that you don't. Thanks for tuning in.